That's good. You guys have good singing voices. Um, we're back in Luke. We took a couple weeks break. You'll remember uh, two weeks ago was our annual meeting, and I used a sermon as a sort of an annual report as well. And then last week was our first Sunday uh, feast, and so we had uh, from that same theme of God's family, but now we're back into uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, if you want to find your way there. Um, and the title of the sermon you see there on the screen, Kingdom Clarity, is given to little children. Um, and the big idea that uh, I want you to bring with you is that the kingdom is hidden from the proud and shown to the humble. The kingdom is hidden from the proud and shown to the to the humble. And three points within that we're going to talk about is Jesus is thankful for the hidden and the revealed. And two, he chooses who will receive the revelation. And three, we ought to be thankful for his revelation. And so in life, we have probably all of us at some time experienced something that was very clear when you thought about it just on a basic and simple level. And then you bring in an expert, and it seems like it got more confusing. Has that ever happened to anybody? That, there's lots of uh, examples we probably could each come up with. I thought it was so simple, and then the expert came in, and it got a lot more confusing to me. Um, I remember when I was... Uh, at Bible College, the president of the college at that time had uh, been, he was from South Africa, and uh, I was in charge of the lawn and garden crew um, as my, I took all these different part-time jobs when I was in Bible College, and uh, I was out in the parking lot painting stripes, and I can't even remember how. I, had, I needed to rig something and so it would make the stripe more straight for me, and, and uh, he came out and he was uh, I don't know if I would say admiring my gimmick, whatever it was I come, I don't even remember what it was. And, uh, and he said a phrase to me in, uh, in a different language from, a from South Africa. And he said, roughly translated, that means the farmer makes a way. And if any of you grew up in a farming community or have been a farmer, um, especially where I come from and where Janelle comes from, her dad was a grain farmer. And the nearest tiny town was miles away. And the nearest town where you could probably get a lot of tools or implements was well over an hour away. And uh, sometimes when you're out in the field and you need to get something working, you do whatever you need to do to get it to work. Um, and yet uh, someone might come in that's an engineer and look at that and mock it and say, well, that's not very sophisticated. That, I, is that all you could do is that? And... and uh, that kind of is what we're going to get at this morning, is this idea that sometimes people have this lofty idea of how things should be. They have these high uh, capacity for knowledge, and yet they miss the very simple. Uh, so learning and becoming an expert, when I say all of that, is not a bad thing. It's a good thing that we have people who have learned and become experts in many different areas. But sometimes the most educated people can make things more difficult. Uh, they might miss the forest for the trees. And God's kingdom has been revealed to people who have a very simple faith and hidden from those considered wise. If you've ever read some commentaries or language study books that uh, go into the biblical languages, you will find at times that some of those are written by people who know the Greek super well or the Hebrew super well, or they know a particular author super well. Maybe they're the expert on James's letter. Maybe they're the expert on Paul's letters. Maybe they're expert on Luke's gospel. And they have all this knowledge, but some of those people who write the very commentaries that some of us use just to for reference are actually not believers. And there's a testimony of a lady, I, I don't remember her name right offhand, but she, was, she had actually written books about, uh, you know, how to critically tear apart the Bible. And then one day the Lord revealed himself to her. And she, threw, she said she threw away her own books because she realized that she had been so, had knowledge in all of this stuff, 
but she never really understood it. And then once she understood it, she wanted others to get rid of her books too. And so we're going to talk about that this morning, that what Jesus is praying uh, towards the, the second half of the passage I'm about to read. I'm going to read the first part of this passage because we preached on it, but it's been a whole three weeks. And I just want to give you a little refresher about the 72 coming back. So we're going to start in verse 17 of Luke chapter 10. It says, The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Why, that's pretty exciting, isn't it? But he said, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And if you missed that sermon, it's still it's on the website. You can go back and uh, listen to it if you like. And then we get to our passage for this morning. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Father is except, I'm sorry, no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then, turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So again, that big idea is the kingdom is hidden from the proud and shown to, your, to the humble. So that's straight out of the text. That's what Jesus was thanking the Father for. He's thankful for the hidden and for the revealed. He chooses who will receive the revelation, and we ought to be thankful for his revelation. All right, so just before this section again, I read it. But Jesus had received the reports of the 72 uh, who were so excited to tell about what had happened on their evangelistic trip. But Jesus said to them that the power of God that they experienced, as great as that was, should not be the main source of their rejoicing, but rather something very simple. You might say very basic, very fundamental. The thing that they ought to be rejoicing in is that their names are written in heaven. And that's a very great reminder to us. When we get excited about things happening in the church, we get excited about the impact of our ministries and how things are happening around us, but it says, Jesus said, get excited about this. If you're in Christ, your name is written in heaven. That should be the source of your energy and excitement. So now Jesus is moving on and he's rejoicing in these things that, that, that is the kingdom and knowing the gospel. These things are hidden from the wise and understanding, but they're revealed to little children. This is found, this concept all over the Bible, by the way, that Sometimes people have great power, great knowledge, or other things, but they miss the most important things. Job 37, 24 says, Therefore men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. So it's very possible for all of us. You know, probably everyone in here, we, if we went around and asked everyone, you could say maybe you're an expert in some area. It might be just in your own life. Maybe you're the expert on your spouse. And nobody else knows as much as your spouse as you. That should be the case, actually. But um, if you get conceited over that, you could miss out on learning even more or growing even closer. There were many people that knew their Bibles inside and out, yet they did not perceive that Jesus was the Blessed One, the Messiah. That's why they crucified him. They had all the information, they had the evidences in front of them, and they missed it. But they still felt very wise. 
And Paul wrote, writes actually in both of the letters to the Corinthians about this. The first uh, one I'm going to read is from 2 Corinthians 3.14. He says, Their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, this, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Remember the lady I told you about? She had all the knowledge, the head knowledge, to write commentaries and had theoretical and educational information. But only when Christ took away the veil from her did she see him for who he was. In 1 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 18, it says this, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. There's so many other biblical references we could go to. For instance, when Samuel came to look over Jesse's kids, right? And one of these is going to be the king. And he looks at them and he says, oh, it must be this one. He's the best looking one. He's the tallest one. He's whatever. And God said, what? I see the heart. I don't look at the things you're looking at. And so we, uh, we see this throughout Scripture, that this idea that we can get so full of head knowledge and be really proud of ourselves, we can think higher of ourselves than we ought, that can also cause us to miss out on the humility we need in order to receive the gospel and be, be drawn into it. So we, we are saying all of this, and again, this is not to say, by the way, that a smart person cannot have faith. Um, you could possibly have heard a message like this and someone might twist it to say, well, that means anyone who goes and gets a degree or something, they're not going to have any faith because they've gotten too smart for it. That's not what he's saying at all. He's talking about a pride and a humility issue here. Something where you're so proud of your information that you have or your knowledge or your success in life that you don't have the humility to say, I am in need. I'm in need of God. I'm in need of a Savior. But those who build up a lot of knowledge or wisdom, they also do that with great pride of self. In fact, some people, that is their main driving factor. They want that top, on the top of the list on the class roster, right? They want the, the summa cum laude or the magna cum laude or whatever it is, that they want the highest honors. They want to have the highest degree, they want to, um, they, they're not satisfied with just an associate's degree, and they're not satisfied with the bachelor's or the master's. Or the doc they need the doctorate, and they not only need the doctorate, they need a Ph.D., and then they need to be honored by others because of that. And a lot of people, that's their motivation. Now, it doesn't mean it's bad to get a Ph.D. It just means that we better be doing it for the right reasons. Are we doing it to serve the Lord, or are we doing it to serve ourselves and our own pride? Because, you know, the truth is it actually takes a humble person to come to faith. A person who has no humility will not put themselves under the God's uh, authority willingly. And so these things are only revealed to those whom God chooses. God chooses who the gospel will be revealed to. Now, many people hear the gospel and do not uh, come to faith. But those that God has chosen will 
have that gospel revealed to them and he will draw them to himself and he'll take that heart of stone and he'll make it a heart of flesh and he'll give them the humility it takes to accept his truth, the truth of the gospel. But to those who are not chosen, their hearts will remain hard. They will get the same information, possibly. Some people hear the same preacher and one believes and one doesn't. Why is that? Is it because one was smarter or one was dumber? One was uh, thinking better? One was... No, it's because God chose one that said, it says he, uh, he chose before the foundation of the world who he would save. And those ones that he has chosen to save, he gives them the humility they need to believe. And other ones, their heart, hearts are hardened. We talked about this in our men's group this week. It's hard for some people to comprehend this because it's, it seems unfair to some people. But even in Romans 9, he, he talks about how some... Uh, even before they were born, God had chosen. And we do have a God that chooses. And so Jesus continues in this prayer of sorts, and he says in verse 22, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one, who, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. See that? God has the choice of who uh, is going to receive. No one knows who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus is the one who makes the Father known. John 1.18, no one has seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he, Jesus, has made him known. And... Uh, Kent Hughes said this, Jesus is the sovereign dispenser of the knowledge of God the Father to those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. No one will see who God or Jesus is unless he reveals him. So when unbelievers tell us they cannot see the beauty of the gospel, we're not surprised. The word of God radiates light, but it cannot be seen unless a person's eye is opened by God. So that's why he says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who's at the Father's side, he's made him known. So the faith to believe is a gift. We know that from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's a gift, just the faith itself. No one comes to uh, Jesus unless they're drawn to him by the Father. And so this is a work of the Father. It's a work of the Son, and it's a work of the Holy Spirit. The Father draws through the Spirit and the Word. Jesus reveals the Father. Salvation is of God. Salvation is of a Trinitarian God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work in perfect harmony to save those he elected to salvation. And Jesus wrote about this in John, or spoke about this as recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 6. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Notice this importance of this. So we can get sometimes over-invested in our means of presenting the gospel. And by that I mean, like, we want to have the nicest building so people would come and hear the gospel here. We want to have the best band so people get warmed up and ready to hear the gospel. We want to have the best programs. We want to have this and that. And we think that we can somehow cause people to come to Christ by some means that we come up with. And the dangerous thing is when those means exceed the means that he's directed us to do that. But in the end, we know that no one is going to come to Christ because of any physical thing we do, any uh, great message we preach or any great songs we sing. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day, as it is written in the prophet, and they all will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he is for, who is from God. He has seen the Father. So it's his work. Salvation is all of God's work, and it's all three members of the Trinity working together. So if you are saved, 
you need to realize that. That should make you very excited to think that the entire Godhead was invested in my salvation. Isn't that awesome? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all worked together to save you. And I didn't hear anyone say hallelujah. You should say hallelujah to that because that's the work of God, the Trinitarian God that we worship. And that's exciting. So now Jesus encourages the disciples to take, a, to take stock sort of of their unique view of the kingdom of work, uh, uh, the kingdom work that Christ is doing. They're, they're like these firsthand spectators, and he wants them to understand and appreciate what a unique opportunity they've had. I'm sure they already did, but he's reminding them this is a really amazing thing you're being part of. And so in verses 23 and 24, He's then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Isn't that true? All of those people from all of history that were part of God's plan, that the prophets that wrote and gave prophetic messages the kings, the remember the, the, the wise men that came and, and they were just anxious to see something revealed to them. And then these disciples are getting this privilege of being firsthand witnesses of something that had been foretold before all the way for thousands of years through all these prophets pointed to through the ordinances of, the, of, of God and through the temple and all of this, and then Jesus comes and they have first row, front row seats. So remember that big idea. The kingdom is hidden from the proud. It's shown to the humble. And Jesus is thankful for the hidden and the revealed. He chooses who will receive the revelation, and we ought to be thankful for his revelation. Now there's a parallel passage to this in Matthew's gospel. Uh, he words it just a little bit differently in chapter 13, starting at verse 16. He says, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it and hear what you hear and did not hear it. John Corson wrote in his application commentary this, have you ever wished you lived in the days of Moses when you could see the Red Sea parting, the Egyptians drowning, the Shekinah glory glowing? Have you ever wished you could live in the days of Elijah when fire came down from the sky and he rode a chariot into heaven? Jesus says, in effect, they, they wish they were us because we understand what they could only wonder about. They could only guess at the meaning of what they wrote. But we see the full picture because we see Jesus. And in him, everything comes together and makes sense. Not only did the prophets and kings and righteous people long to see this, but Peter wrote, even the angels longed to look into it. 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 10, he says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So we are blessed even more so in a sense because we have the entirety of scripture that explains to us where where a prophecy pointed to Christ and where it was fulfilled we have this great advantage that that we actually have this bible this word of god to read for ourselves to study it to compare it to see where it makes sense, and that's everywhere in it once you start to understand. And these prophets, as Peter writes, they searched and inquired carefully. 
they inquired what person or time the Spirit of Christ was indicating. And, and it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. In the end, those prophets had to realize, I'm only doing this for somebody else because I'm not going to get to know exactly what this is pointing to. I'm not going to know the final exact details of the results. Those prophets were only faithful to write down what they heard or saw and record it for those who would come later. But even angels long to look into this. This is the great mystery and secret that God has revealed to us the mystery of salvation. See, we have the benefit of the prophets and the apostles. They teach us still. They teach us through the word. And what they wrote about, they did not fully understand. But now, those in Christ, we who have access to this word, we can have this experience. And even then, we don't fully comprehend the glories to await, we can't comprehend uh, by our minds before that day. And so we look forward with great anticipation. And we wonder how much even more God is going to reveal to us. But if we've had his salvation revealed to us, we've, we have everything. If you are one who he's revealed himself to and he's drawn you to himself, I hope you have a sense of appreciation of all of the effort that went into that, all of the coordinated work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of the thousands of years of prophecies and writings. And he used all of that and the gospel message to draw you to himself if you're in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, I pray that he's going to draw you to himself so that your mind will be, your blinders will be taken off and your mind will be open and that you would find the humility you need to believe. 1 Corinthians 2, starting at verse 6, uh, has a long section as well about wisdom and how we need to uh, think of the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. It says, Yet among the mature we impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Why is it a secret and hidden wisdom of God? Well, because he, we read earlier, he chooses who he's going to reveal it to. To those who have never had this revealed to them, it's secret and hidden. They look at it and say it's folly, it's foolishness. None of the rulers of this age understand that, understood this, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of this uh, the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. So we do this a lot. I'll, I've heard many, many discussions in my life about what people think heaven will be like. We have all these. I'll say so-called heavenly visitors that write books, right? I went to heaven, and here's what I saw, and I'll buy my book. I'm going to become a millionaire off the book. Unfortunately, most, almost none of those are biblical. They, they have all these strange descriptions. The Bible tells us all we need to know for now about heaven, but we still wonder, don't we? We hear these questions. Well, will heaven have this? Will heaven, we get to do that in heaven. Will we get to play golf in heaven? And and, uh, and you think, well, but if you did get to play golf in heaven, uh, if you hit a bad shot, that wouldn't be right, right? But then if you hit all perfect shots, then it wouldn't be very interesting. And, and so people wonder about the weirdest things. What's going to be going on in heaven? And some people here have more imagination than the rest of us. I have people that live in the same home as me whose imaginations are much better than mine. But no matter how good your imagination and how wonderful you have pictured heaven if you've done that, no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. See that? Once again, people have trouble with this. Well, only The only ones that come to Christ are the ones God revealed himself. Well, can't people somehow come to faith without him revealing it? No, 
He has chosen who he will reveal to. We have a choosing God. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's heart except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, see again, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. If you believe this gospel, if you believe the Bible, if you believe about Jesus the way the Bible explains him to you, you believe that not because of any mental capacity in yourself. You believe it because the Spirit of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together graciously and mercifully before the foundation of the world determined that you would be one of those he would call and that he would use his means and his time to draw you to himself. In some people, the means that he uses is that you got to grow up in a family of believers. And you learned the gospel from a a very young age, and you inherited the traditions, but God implanted in your heart the belief that you needed. And for other people, you didn't grow up in that situation. And some people get all the way till they're almost in their dying days, and God brings the gospel. But there is no difference between the child who is dedicated to the Lord when they were two weeks old in this respect to that one who was saved late in life. They both were chosen before the foundation of the world. And miraculously, through God's means, whatever they were, the gospel and his spirit, but delivered in different ways, different times to different people, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son, all three had a partnership with a goal in mind to make sure that those who are called before the foundation of time would certainly come to him. If that's you, that should be very encouraging. If God is for us, who can be against us? So the big idea again, I'm going to wrap it up here I just want you to be encouraged today if you're in Christ it's a pretty special thing the kingdom is hidden from the proud and shown to the humble if you're in Christ it's because God caused you to have a a heart that was a heart of stone to begin with he transformed it into a heart of flesh that could receive in a humble way the gifts that he had for us Jesus is thankful for the hidden and the revealed. We didn't talk about that a lot, but he said, I'm thankful that you've hidden these things from the wise. Why would he be thankful that God hid them from the wise? Well, that could be a whole another exploration, right? I think, though, that the answer can be very simplified in the sense that whatever God has done in all of this is that whatever it would do to give him the most glory. And when he proves himself the strength for the weak, when he proves himself the wisdom for the simple, he's being glorified. And he chooses who will receive that revelation. And so we ought to be thankful for his revelation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this message this morning. I pray that your people, Lord, those who you have called by your name, I pray that they would be very encouraged this morning, Lord, to know what a great partnership and effort was made on their behalf to save them. Lord, those who grew up in a believing family who from early in age were given the the gift of knowing your truth and being taught it by their parents, Lord, may they appreciate greatly how your sovereign will 
orchestrated for them to grow up in that family so they may come to you. And Lord, for people who didn't grow up in that situation, but they came to you through another way. Lord, I pray that they would also appreciate that their entire life was in your hands even before they knew it. And Lord, may we have a sense that your capacity is so far above ours, we won't comprehend it fully. But that from all eternity, you determined who would be saved. And up until the time that they are saved, you have orchestrated things to happen that not one that you had chosen would be lost. And Lord, for those that we know, have, we don't think have come to you yet, Lord, we continue to pray for them. Lord, in your good and gracious will, we pray for those we love. And we don't give up on them, Lord, because we don't know what your timing will be. But we trust them to you, Lord, because we know that your will is perfect and that everything that you have set to happen will happen. Lord, may we appreciate the fact that we'll not understand this side of heaven, how glorious it's going to be, but let us anticipate it, Lord. May you reinstill in our hearts this morning a deeper hope for our future, a deeper love for you, a deeper desire to serve you in our lives now, a deeper love for your family, the church, a deeper desire to see the gospel shared. May we be motivated by hope, Lord, and may we live our lives to your glory in Jesus' name.